الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون وقال عز وجل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال عز وجل إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ذلك الفوض الكبير رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وأهل العقدة من لساني يفكه قولي اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه آمين يا رب Today inshallah I'm going to talk about something I hope you find interesting and that is if you read the Quran you will find that hundreds of times the Quran repeats the terminology it's sometimes you it's not just words it becomes a terminology within the Quran itself the terminology of jannat in tajrim in tahtiha al-anhar jannah garden underneath which rivers flow i'm sure many of you have read quran and maybe sometimes you wondered why allah uses this symbolism even though you know jannah is described in many different ways for example the uh, uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran ka'san dihaka that your cup will always be full you all all of us have experienced something we like drinking and we have that regret that it's coming to the end it's the last sip that will never happen so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes jannah in so many different ways alal ara'iki yanzurun they will be sitting in their couches up high looking at the world around them looking about But out of all the descriptions, out of the hundreds of descriptions given in Quran for the paradise, for heaven, the single most repeated description of paradise, or you can say the, sim- the symbolic status that Allah chooses to give Jannah is Jannah in Tajreem in Tahtih al Jannah, which is generally translated as gardens, underneath which rivers flow. And anyone who has read Quran from beginning to end will notice that this terminology or this these words are used over and over again throughout the whole of Quran. So <clears throat> it became an interest to me but also because of its repetition and it's not just holding the meaning or the status of just words but held holding the status of becoming a terminology or a symbolic gesture for which by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes jannah now it's easy to understand for people that were at the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they were living in the desert and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word jannah garden for the people that were living in the desert this is quite easy to understand that the desert is a arid land with no water and so the opposite of it where there is shade and there is greenery and there is water jannah perfectly fits within the cultural context in which the quran was revealed to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam easily describing to the people that were the recipients of the quran meaning the companions of the prophet meaning the recipient was the prophet but from there the recipients were the companions of the prophet to the whole world So the listeners of Quran rather I should say the direct listeners of Quran it made complete sense to them that even in the Arab world at that time the greatest and the most uh, high value property would be a property that has gardens in it and uh, more than that if it has a self irrigation system meaning water in it that is self irrigating the land it would even be more popular and there are i can't go into the details right now but some of the events of the companions of the prophet you know who it has been mentioned in the seerah of the prophet like this companion of the prophet had a garden and he gave the garden away for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it was considered a big deal 
like for example, one of the properties by the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, where there was a garden, the Prophet ﷺ wanted to annex that garden to the Masjid. And so he had asked the companion of the Prophet who had that garden that to give a portion of it or something, but he gave all of it. And uh, that was a big sacrifice. Uh, it, if you read the whole story, it was a big sacrifice on his part. The point being that garden in the time of the Prophet ﷺ was clearly a high-valued property and a, 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 a garden represented the opposite of the arid land, the land of where there's no water, where you have gardens and trees and dates. You know, this is a, would be quite refreshing to anyone who is the listener of Qur'an at the time of the Prophet. But Qur'an is also a guidance to all humanity and its message is relevant to all of humanity. So, why Allah uses the word Jannah? You know, Allah can use so many things. For example, just one more example so you understand what I'm trying to say. In Jannah will be your house. When the Prophet ﷺ went to Mi'raj, he said to Umar, I saw your house. Your house in Jannah. As you know the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet said, whoever makes a masjid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a masjid with a house for him. Whoever makes a masjid for Allah, meaning the house of Allah on earth, Allah will make a house for him in paradise. So why not mention the palaces you'll have, which the Prophet has called palaces for some of the women. Some of the women will have uh, houses in uh, Jannah that are shaped uh, differently. They're shaped like jewelry, but they're houses. Uh, but anyway, I'm not going to into description of Jannah right now. The description itself of Jannah, I want to talk about the word Jannah. Allah didn't mention you'll get these residential houses and so on and so forth, but Allah mentioned you'll get uh, you'll get these gardens, these residential gardens, you can say. Houses were not mentioned as a symbolic gesture to repeat over and over again. So what are some reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have chosen these words? And because they're repeated so many times, it is worth our attention, you can say, to ponder over the the fact of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this. So I want to bring to you a few frameworks when you consider Jannah, the garden, some frameworks that should come to your mind. Number one, psychologically speaking, there are two types of human beings. There's three, but two major types of human beings. There's extroverts and introverts. Extroverts, they like to go outside. They like to be outside. They like to do things outside. They want to do activities. They want to be outside. They want to do things. They want to go hunting. They want to go fishing. They want to do something. Maybe an extra, uh, extrovert, uh, you can say, uh, sister or wife, she wants to go to parties or she wants to go shopping or something. You know, She wants to be outdoors. Some people have a social makeup in their personality, they like to be outgoing, you can say. But other per people are introverts. They don't like to socialize that much. They like to be inside. They like to be doing what they're doing. They like to be in their own world, you can say. They like to be in their own world. Jannah describes a state that is like Imam Ghazali calls it Dalhiz. You know, that he's in a state where you're not outside and you're not inside. You're in the, right in the middle between the two. You're not outside. Like the hinge of the door is that he's. Or, you know, in the olden days they would have uh, a, a outside. So there's the house, then there's the that he's, and then the outside world. So that he's is the barrier. So Jannah is a word that, from a personality perspective, is private, a garden, Jannah, the word Jannah, private is Jannah, is private enough to be acceptable, you can say, to the mindset of the introvert, but it is also acceptable just as much to the extrovert because it is outdoor, but yet it is not outdoor, it is also indoor because they're private residential gardens, which I will share with you a linguistic aspect which I've shared before, but just so that it's clear to the people that have not heard this before. Any word in the Arabic language that has jim and noon in it has the essence of privacy or hiddenness in it. For example, the word jinn. So jinn is, shaitan is amongst the jinn. You cannot see him. He is hidden. 
In the same way, Jinan is the womb of the mother, which you cannot see the womb, so it's hidden. So Jannah is a place that is hidden. It's not just you know, open to anyone, but it's your private residential garden in which you allow only those who you allow. So Jannah is a place where you have your privacy, but at the same time, as you will see, gardens play a, the function of community, both according to the Quran as well as the what we find happening in the world of gardens in the world that we live in. Let me explain this this way. So Jannah, the Jannah, the garden, this Jannah is a place that is going to be mentally suitable to the introvert, and this Jannah will be mentally suitable to the extrovert, both of them. So this is the first framework that I want you to keep in mind. Second is aesthetics versus functionality. A garden is very beautiful, but it's not just beautiful. A garden is something that's very functional. It's functionally it's, it's, it has a functional aspect as well as an aesthetic aspect in one. In the same way, Jannah, the garden, has the, aspect, the, the, the psychological aspect of feeling of rest. When you're in a garden, you're in a state of rest, you're meaning in a peaceful state. But also it has the sense of activities. For example, uh, there are studies done by University of Michigan about how gardens give a sense of tranquility. But they're also, gardens are also used in therapy for helping people doing some activities and therapies, especially because they have to use their hands a lot in gardening and stuff like that. So the garden has a psychological aspect that is functional and aesthetic. So there is the beautiful car, but it has to be designed. I mean, there's the, the, the functional, like a car that goes very fast is the function of it. But how beautiful it looks is, is the aesthetics of it. So garden is both functional and aesthetics. But also, the next part that I was mentioning, which is that the garden is both a place of peace of mind, tranquility, reflection, and also a place of activity, both. So you can see that the word garden is, is a very comprehensive word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to represent where we're going to go. So, and then of course there are other aspects to it. For example, where did Adam والسلام, where was he when he began his journey? He was in Jannah. And then where will we go back? We will go back in Jannah. So that connection is also there. But anyway, continuing uh, from there, I want to share with you some points. Number one, University of Michigan did some research on gardens. And uh, why should one have gardens? And in the olden days, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I will share with you something that's a little bit, it's related to this, but a little bit off topic. You will perhaps enjoy it. That, you know, nowadays, downtown is the center of commerce, right? And then, and then after that, you have the suburbs. In the olden days, especially in the Islamic cities, now when I say Islamic cities, which cities am I referring to? Mecca, Medina, Kufa, Basra, Fez in Africa, Alexandria in Africa, so these cities that were built by the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu or soon after, meaning Kufa was built by the companions of the Prophet, Basra was built by the companions of the Prophet, Mecca and Medina was there on the time of the Prophet. So how was the structure of that society? So downtown, instead of being commerce, commerce used to be out on the outskirts of the city. So instead of going downtown to, uh, downtown for commerce, you would go to the outskirts of the city for commerce. The, the center of the, of the, basically almost center of the, of, the, of, the, of the city would be the big masjid, the Jami masjid, the masjid Jami, which would be there and then there would be graveyards. And graveyards would be all over the place in the, in the outskirts and in the inside, but there would be a graveyard in the center. You can never even imagine a graveyard in downtown nowadays, I think. But the point I'm trying to make is that the individual houses <coughs> that would be between the masjid and the commerce centers. So you have these uh, houses in the middle of this, basically. And so uh, in the way the houses was, I don't know if you've seen those houses anymore, but there would be a garden in every single house in the olden days. When I say olden days, I mean pre-industrial times. Even uh, like my grandfather had a house that basically had a center 
with an open roof, basically, and there was a garden right in the center of it. So Muslims are very used to having gardens in their houses or around them and so on and so forth. And that's something that is being more and more discovered in over here. And as I will show you some statistics, inshallah. Um, anyway, so what did the University of Michigan find out about having a garden? Number one, that having a garden gives you a state of mental clarity. Your mind becomes clear. Your thoughts become clear. Your thoughts become organized. So when you are in a garden, a garden helps you reflect better, think better, understand better, think deeper, in a way that uh, another, uh, another surrounding may not be able to uh, deliver. Second, which is also very interesting, uh, psychologically, when you are in a garden, you have a feeling of reward. Jannah is a place of reward. And so psychologically, by being in a garden, you feel like you're being rewarded. It's a psychological phenomenon that takes place. Um, and then, of course, there's a whole bunch of statistics that have to do with the fact that you're healthier, your food's right there. On average, food travels, just so you know, most of the time when you are, and especially with this, is maybe even more because we get our food from even farther. But most of the time when we get our food, on average, a food travels at 1,300 miles to get to your plate on average. Whereas when you are in a garden, the food is right there, which again symbolizes you get what you want immediately. As far as uh, property value, I think you'll find this interesting. Uh, they did a, uh, a research in Milwaukee that for every square foot you have a garden, your property value increases by $24.77 in Milwaukee, not in Jenna. But the point I'm trying to make is that a garden also represents, because once you've built your, your fabulous house, what do you do next? You start building the outdoors. You want an outdoor kitchen, right? You start building the outdoors is what happens. And, and what happens, people, instead of staying inside, start staying in their private gardens that they have on the outside. And so the garden also represents high property value. This would be interesting, but I'm just saying this... Uh, because of the verse in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nafsul mutma'inna, O you soul that is rested, Ya ayyuhal nafsul mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiti radiyatam mardiya, go back to your Lord, happy and satisfied, radiyatam mardiya, Allah is happy with you and you're happy with Allah, fadkhuli fi ibadi, wadkhuli jannati, enter with my servants, meaning, you're going to enter, where are all the criminals going to be? They'll be on the other side, right? The good people will be on the side of Jannah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the good people to be together in one place, and the criminals will be on the other side. And the point I'm trying to make here is that there's an interesting correlation. The studies show, uh, there, was a, there was research done in Chicago that there was 52% less crimes wherever there was more greed. You know, in the ghetto areas, for example, uh, this uh, Giuliani, Mayor Giuliani, you all probably heard of him. One of the things that he did to stop crime in New York, because it's a very high crime rate, one of his accomplishments, even though I don't personally agree with him politically at all, but one of the things that he was able to do was to bring down crime in New York. And the way he did it was, uh, it, it's a theory based upon, it's called the crack window theory, that if you go to some place and if you see broken windows, chances are more people are going to break windows. But if you go to a place where there's no broken windows and everything is fixed and there's no, there's no graffiti and everything is perfect, chances are people are going to be less inclined to do something bad. So one of the first things that Mayor Giuliani did was he got rid of all the graffiti in the subways and so on and so forth. But one of the other things that he did that was very interesting is he started growing gardens, especially in the ghetto neighborhoods where there, people are poor, where crime is very high. And so... It, both in New York and Chicago, it showed that wherever there was gardens, crime decreased by an average of 52%. Uh, Philadelphia, uh, there, there's other, uh, for example, there was a parking lot they took in Philadelphia that was just a vacant parking lot. They converted it into a garden, and they talked about like crime in that area decreased by 90%. There's many reasons for this, because when the whole community is in gardens, in the garden, People are at, in the garden, there's more eyes looking at what's happening, so on and so forth. So I'm just 
mentioning this not as a direct relevance to Jannah, because that Jannah that we will go to, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَذْ وَلَا أُذْنٌ سَمِعَذْ وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرْ That no eyes have seen, no ears have heard, no heart has ever thought of it. But I'm simply mentioning that since the Qur'an mentions gardens underneath, underneath which canals flow, and I'll talk about, if I have time, the river flowing also, but Allah mentioning this over and over again, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trying to convey to us based upon the knowledge that we have? And so, like I said, it is a place of aesthetics and functionality. It is a place of activity, but it is also a place of rest. It is a place where you are in your privacy, but yet you are still connected to the community. And like the Prophet himself said, sallallahu alayhi wa that people will invite each other to Jannah. So meaning you will have parties in Jannah. This is a, you know, a saying of the Prophet And Jannah represents high value. But above and beyond all of these, you can say, somewhat materialistic things, I'm going to go into the other spiritual side of this in a little bit. But I also want to mention some things uh, that are relevant. Um, Inshallah, I will continue in my second khutbah, Inshallah, because time is running out. Aqulu qawli hadha, astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa nisa, al muslimin wa al muslimin. Inna alhamdulillahi na'maduhu, nasta'inuhu, nasta'afiru. ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى والدين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون وقال عز وجل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم
therefore. We would choose more responsibilities. And at the same time, we choose more difficulty for us. And so Abu Bakr said, I wish I was a blade of grass and I would have been burnt away. That when I think about, I have to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَانِ And so, what, that is one aspect. But the other aspect of the word Jannah is that you will reap what you sow. If you don't put in the seeds today, the Prophet said, you know, one of the most awesome mystic, most awesome statements of the Prophet. The Prophet, in a conversation with his companion, he says that even if, it, if you see the Day of Judgment coming and you have a seed in your hand, you have a seed in your hand and you see the day of judgment coming, put the seed in the ground because you'll get its reward in the hereafter, even though the day of judgment is there. But Jannah represents the fruits of your labor. Jannah represents what you have put into this life for the next life. It, what are we giving for the next life? What sacrifices are we giving for the next life? But for that, we have to really believe that there is a next life. We have to be sure and certain that there is a next life. And so if you're not, for what price? You know, the Prophet asked, the Prophet said this, and he also, there's two ahadiths in this regard. The Prophet says, Ala sidratillahi ghaliya. He says, know it, that the price of Allah is expensive. Allah is not just something cheap that's going to give you Jannah for nothing. He wants sacrifice. He wants Sacrifice. If there is no sacrifice, what do you expect this high-valued, stress-free property to be for? For for what? Just because you know God is a good luck charm? He's just a good luck charm, just like any other good luck charm. Or is Allah gonna really is it gonna be a serious situation? Because our concept of God nowadays in the pre in this postmodern world is no different honestly than a good luck charm let me try let me try my luck with god might work might not work i don't know and so what are you going to give to earn the price of allah is not cheap you never were able to estimate who Allah really was. The creator of the heavens, but you know, we don't have time to think about these things. You will reap what you sow. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, for every subhanAllah you say, there's a tree in Jannah. So the idea of the garden is that you will reap what you sow. But what are you going to give? What is your commitment to Islam? What is your commitment to Allah? What is your commitment to His Messenger? You have to decide today. I am fully committed to Allah and His Messenger. You have to decide today that I dedicate in salati wa nusuti wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. My life, my death, my sacrifice, all of it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam is a movement. Islam is not just something static, it's a movement. So, what will you sow? What will you reap? So yeah, gardens have many benefits. I didn't even get to talk about tajlim and tahtiyal and have the, the rivers that flow underneath the, the gardens. I didn't get a chance to talk about that. But the garden is the ideal place to be, whether you're in today's time or another time when you are... Uh, anyway... That's a separate issue, so let's inshallah do dua and then we will end. There are announcements inshallah if you listen to them. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa kina adab al-nar. Rabbana dhalamna anfusana wa illam dhafil lana wa tarhamna lana kunana min khasirin. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make Jannah a guarantee for us. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us, each one of us, to do good deeds that will enter us into Jannah. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please forgive us. Ya al hayu ya al qayyum bi rahmatika astaghith. Ya al hayu ya al qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghith. Allahumma taj'al Qur'ana rabiyya qulubina wa nura sudurina. 
وارزقنا تلاوته آناء الليل وأطراف النهار آمين يا رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إن بهمت مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إن بهمت مجيد آمين يا رب إن الله يعمركم بالأذل والإحسان وإيتاء القرب وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله يذكركم فاستجب لكم فأقيموا الصلاة